the, the recording is now on and it will be Arnaud from Bitcris, one of the founders that will be giving a talk about what we are doing at Bitcris with the Rust programming language and what you can expect to see and not see in the future when it comes to Rust and the crazy fly. So yes, please enjoy this workshop. Thank you, Jonas. So welcome to this uh, workshop, Rust and the crazy fly. I'm Arno from Bitcrace. Uh, so yeah, here I will be talking about what we, uh, what use we see or hope for the Rust programming language in the crazy fly ecosystem. A couple of us have Bitcrace. Uh, like Rust quite a lot. So um, this is uh, this is a way to move that forward and to see what can be done with Rust and Crisfly. So I'll uh, start a little bit with the Rust language in itself because I will assume most of you don't know much about it. So the language was started in 2009 at Mozilla, about the same time we started Crisfly and stabilized, uh, they reached 1. reached 1.0 in 2015, same time we reached CrazyFly 2.0. So it's quite in sync here. Um, it is a, a quite stable language. Uh, since 1.0, they have stability guarantee, which means that uh, we should not expect any code to break. A uh, code that was written for Rust 1.0 should still compile nowadays. Uh, this is mostly true. There's some exception, but those are really, really niche. I mean, something had to be broken, uh, but those were very weird and niche use case. Um, but they have uh, implemented the optional additions to be able to improve the language without breaking compatibilities. Additions are optional. You can apply them to your crate. A crate is a Rust uh, uh, package. So it's uh, like a pip package. It's a, a unit you can ship around. and um, crates in your project can have different editions. So it's really optional. You, a, a crate made with Py, um, Rust 1.0 will still compile nowadays, even though, even if you compile it with Rust uh, 2021, which can be released tomorrow actually. Uh, and the Rust Foundation was started in 2021. So Mozilla last year fired most of the, um, of its employee that worked on Rust, which was a bit shocking. But the result of that was quite benefic because now um, Rust is not handled by a silicon entity or company anymore. It has a foundation, but is part of it as founding members. And there's a lot of big company part of it, all the usual suspect of Google, Amazon, uh, and so on. But also a lot of small company interested in Rust. Uh, Rust is performant. It compiles to machine code. Uh, using LLVM, so uh, the same uh, engine under uh, one of the two uh, most used uh, C compiler, open source C compiler, uh, and it allows low level, low level access to the machine. So in that sense, it's very much like C. Uh, it, it is often called a system programming language. It's much more than that, but it is. It can do the work C does. Uh, it is reliable, uh, very strongly typed with type inference. So you do not have to type uh, to set the types everywhere, but the type uh, is known by the compiler everywhere. Um, and it's uh, memory safe. So it, it has a mechanism to uh, ensure memory safety. Data race is basically impossible in uh, safe Rust. So it has an unsafe mode where rules are a little bit relaxed, but in safe Rust, you cannot have any data race and it makes programming Rust very nice because you feel very safe uh, while doing it. You know that there's a whole class of bugs that are basically impossible. Um, and it is quite productive. Um, they, it has a pretty modern tooling. We, the Rust people learn from all the tools. So it has a package manager like NPM or PIP. Uh, but we try to avoid some of the mistakes of them. Um, and most of the tools apply convention over configuration, uh, which means that most of the time it basically works out of the box. And if you want to do something special, then you can configure it. Uh, but that has a lot of advantage that the whole ecosystem will basically look like 
Um, so it's very easy to look at other people's codes and projects and everything uh, kind of works the same way. Um, and it's also pretty easy to get started then. The, the compiler is extremely useful. The error message are very good and a bad error message in the compiler is considered a bug by the compiler team, uh, which is really, really nice. The compiler is really trying to help. It's very, very picky, but it's going to try to help writing good code and writing code that actually compiles, which is what's important. Um, where do we use Rust at Bitcraze? Uh, in the shipping printer. So uh, a couple of years ago, I made a small program to print the shipping document, uh, like a shipping label and picking a uh, picking document. Um, so if you have ordered anything from Bitcraze in the last two or three years, uh, your order was handled by Rust at some point, just before shipping. Yeah. Uh, and this is a perfect place to start with Rust because this is a small program, isolated, uh, and it just needs to work. And as long as it works, no one cares how it's written. So it was a nice way to actually get my hand dirty and get some code that actually uh, is useful. Um, lately, I've been uh, playing around with making Chris Radio, Chris Flying, and Chris Fly Lib crate. So basically, being able to control the Chris Fly from the PC uh, using runs. One of my uh, guiding project is to make a web client because Rust has quite good support for WebAssembly that can run in a web browser. So I have a prototype of web client working with that and I'm working towards getting something uh, running in public. Uh, and also it has possible binding to Python, C++, ROS, what, what's not. We've been playing around, I mean, we've been thinking about the idea of having this like universal lib that we maintain and that everyone could use. That could be it. At least it's a good experiment. Uh, and Jonas here has made, has made a crazy mouse, one of these uh, Fun Friday. Uh, that's a Rust program that actually uh, uses the flow deck to implement a mouse on your PC. It's pretty cool. Uh, and then Rust in the firmware, where it becomes exciting because hard. Uh, harder. Uh, so we've experimented with deck drivers in Rust. Uh, crazy fly apps in Rust, that's what this talk is all about. And uh, I have made, uh, to experiment a little bit, uh, crazy fly 2 STM bootloader uh, in Rust. Uh, and that's a nice test because it shows that you can write, I mean, the, the bootloader is, uh, must fit in 16K of uh, Flash and it works. I can get a Rust program that looks much better than the C program we have right now and that implements a bootloader in less than 60k of flash. So it was a nice experiment to see how small we could uh, get it. So I thought I would uh, do a little bit of introduction about ru how Rust look, uh, because we'll be writing some Rust on the second part of this workshop. Uh, so that's some very simple code. You can see that uh, declaring function is done with a keyword fn. Parameters, we put the type after, the name of the parameter, uh, and the return type is set with a small arrow. Uh, something missing here, there's no return. We didn't type return. It's because in Rust, the last statement of the function, if there is no semicolon, will actually be the return uh, value. It's very, very common in the Rust uh, code to see this. Uh, the main function is the one that runs on PC, at least. Uh, declaring variable is done with let. Uh, and here we declare the Y variable with mute. That's because variable by default are immutable. They're essentially constants. You cannot change the value. And that's uh, quite common in Rust. Uh, the safe way is the easy way. And if you want to hear to the slightly unsafe, you need to write more text. And that's the case in that case. There's nothing more safe than a unmutable variable. It cannot change. Uh, but if you want it mutable, you can have it mutable, but you have to write it, you have to think about it, like do, you have to think about why you want it mutable while you're writing this method. Uh, and uh, here we call the function, and the only reason we can do that is because y is mutable, uh, setting y to the, the, the result of function, and then we print the result. This exclamation mark means that print ln is a uh, macro. Same thing, uh, macro does much, can do much more than a function. 
So Rust wants to be explicit about it and you put an exclamation mark when you call a macro. So it's very clear that this is not just a function. There is something missing here. In main, there's no types, nowhere. And that's where the type inference come into place. Uh, X and Y will be I32. And the reason why X and Y are I32 is because they're argument to add and result of add. And those are I32. Uh, it's very common to not type any type uh, in, in, the, in the code when using API. However, in function um, definition, it is mandatory uh, to, put, to put types. Uh, now let's talk slightly about ownership. So, because that's what makes Rust a little bit uh, special, this notion of ownership. I wrote a very simple program here. We have function calculate length that takes a string, calls length on the string and returns a value. So return the length of the string. Pretty useless, but simple. And then we declare our string from hello. Uh, we get the length and we try to print both the string and the length. This is not going to compile. The reason is that we pass the string, uh, we give the string away. By passing here in C, it would be by value, but in Rust, by passing the string that way, we give it away to the calculate length. So then it's going to be owned by this function. And when we reach the end of the function, it's going to be dropped from memory. So at this point, the string doesn't exist anymore, and the string is not owned by main anymore. Uh, the error we get should, uh, is actually very useful from a compiler. It just tells us that this string borrow of mood value s. So the s has type string uh, that cannot be copied. We could mark it as copyable uh, for free, but we did not. Uh, we moved it here, and it's borrow here after the move. So the println we try to borrow, and the way to fix this uh, this error is to actually borrow what println will do uh, by default. And we do that by adding an n percent. So it's very similar to a pointer. I think it's implemented as a pointer underline, um, uh, by Rust. But what that means is that we give um, a reference, a non-mutable reference of s to the function, which will allow it to call length and then give back the reference, but the S is still owned by mail. And then this is uh, all nice and the compiler is super happy. At first, when I started learning Rust, I thought that this uh, borrowing thing and this ownership was super weird and clunky and it would be something that I would have to get used to it, that's it. Uh, but it ended up being something very, very nice. Uh, that allows to implement really nice abstraction and APIs. And the perfect example, I think, is a mutex. So a mutex, a mutual, execution, uh, mutual exclusion uh, lock usually uh, allows you to protect um, a piece of data or something against uh, parallel access at the same time in a multi-threaded system. And I took one from uh, the firmware. So in storage.c that handles uh, um, uh, persistent storage, uh, we actually create a mutex in init, but we create it in isolation. And then this mutex happens to be used to protect this KVE here, K, the, the, the key value embedded, I think that means, uh, that is not reentrant and that cannot be used from two places at the same time. So each time we call anything on this KVE here for storing a value, uh, we log the mutex before, call, uh, unlock the mutex. There's a lot of implicit things here. I mean, this works, uh, but it works because whoever wrote that understood what he was doing, was not too tired this day, uh, and did not forget anything. And when we add new function, we have to, uh, in six months, when we want to add one new function, we really need to make sure that we're doing that. If we're doing any, if we are forgetting any of this line here, it will be a very big problem. If you forget to lock, you will have random bugs. If you uh, forget to unlock, you will have a lockup. It's going to be pretty bad. Uh, on the Rust side, the way you would do a mutex, uh, 
is to have like we have a mutex object and the new function for this mutex object that that's a convention in Rust like you would create object with new takes any type t by uh, by by owning it it will take ownership of of t which means that what we would do is that we will create our storage potentially that doesn't exist but that's an example and we will get a we we'll create a new mutex and give it the storage and from here the storage is not our any uh, not ours anymore we cannot access it it's not possible the compiler would not let us access the storage anymore and the only way to access it is to call the log function the log function will return a smart pointer that will allow you to access every field of the of uh, of the storage object and as soon as this smart pointer is dropped the lock the the mutex is released and someone else can lock it so this call here will look like this uh, that cannot fail there is no way to use this uh, and make a mistake and actually it's even better than that is that this store will most likely take a mutable reference to itself to the storage so rust will not have let us use store without the mutex if we want to share it so it would not have been possible to actually use this and make a mistake. We must put it in a mutex or to something that will allow us to uh, to share it if we want to share it around uh, to multiple modules. Uh, yeah, and let's look uh, briefly at Rust in embedded because I think that's one of the big advantage of Rust is that it can also be used in uh, embedded systems. And the reason is that it, it has little to no runtimes. Uh, no uh, garbage creator, nothing like that. It's very similar to C. Uh, performant, like C. The standard library is optional, which means that the ecosystem is kind of split in two between the non, non, no STD, which is what we use for no standard library crate, and STD crate. But the advantage is that it's very clear what uh, a crate for embedded is. And there is a lot of crate that are designed or is it either adapted for embedded, like a lot of the cryptographic reps, crates have a no STD mode, uh, or even designed for embedded, like the heapless uh, crate that implements a lot of things like vectors uh, without requiring uh, um, allocation, uh, dynamic allocation. Uh, and there's also a lot of research being done to use a type system for, uh, for uh, writing better embedded programs. Embedded HAL implements a lot of interface for things like I2C, SPI, which allows you to make uh, I2C drivers of a sensor that will work on any platform that has an embedded HAL uh, interface implemented. Uh, there is embedded HAL actually implement type safe hardware driver. It's impossible to give a GPIO that is not UART enabled to a UART driver at compile time. So again, a lot of errors that are uh, stopped at compile time. And we have some great modern tooling like ProBrun and DFMT. ProBrun allows you to just run a program as if it was on your PC, but it runs on the embedded platform. And DFMT implements super efficient uh, printf that runs on the host. Uh, so you can printf a lot of things from interrupt if you want. So uh, yeah, but let's code. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the push demo. The same push demo that's being uh, implemented uh, in C, in the firmware. Uh, we're going to try to do it in Rust. And to get started, we will start with uh, Crazy Fly app Hello Rust RS. That's available on my GitHub. Uh, we'll put the link uh, in, the, um, in the description of the video when we upload it. Uh, and let's look very briefly how this is uh, implemented. So uh, the hello world, this is an out of tree, um, out of tree uh, app. And we do it very much like a C app, app equal one. We include the crazy fly make file. And the only thing we do is that we will include the rust part as a library. And we will build uh the the the, the rust project is uh, set up to be built as a library and just copies the resulting library into the bin folder and that's it uh, there's not not much else to do uh and then in lib.c we have uh as an external c function so accessible from c 
created an app main that uh, that in that case only prints hello world in the console. To uh, access uh, C functions, we can declare them as them at extern C and just declare the function and call them. So calling C from Rust is uh, generally speaking uh, very easy. Maybe I have space for my face now. Um, but let's uh, let's start. So the push demo, if you've seen my previous talk, but I will describe it very quickly. We have the we have the crazy fly, and we have ranging sensors, and we want if we detect an object to move in the other direction. So the first thing would be to acquire uh, the value from this uh, from this sensor, and the first thing I would like to do is to actually generate a, a binding for for the the other crazy fly uh, um, functions and writing this is nice for a couple of function but it will become pretty uh, tiresome to write manual bindings for all the function of the crazy fly but we are lucky there is a tool called bindgen and uh, i already prepared a comment for it But basically, what I will add to uh, to my make file is the call to bind gen, and that will create. It will take. I created a crazyfly.h that includes all the all the header file I want to access, and bind gen will just from this uh, header file generate crazyflysys.rs, uh, and I I add all the includes. This comes from the crazyfly make file. This allows to have all the include paths from the crazyfly firmware. Uh, and now when I do make binding, it, it does not work. Uh, I need to save. It's always a small thing. So yeah, that's what's been generated. So that's all the um, all the types and all the all the um, functions in the crazy fly. And for example, there's all these log functions that will allow us to pull uh, values from the uh, from the crazy fly, and they are defined here as extern C. And we even have the doc from uh, from the C uh, header actually, which is pretty nice. Um, yes, and this will ju we'll just need, I didn't show, but the, we'll just need a couple of more, uh, to interface C, uh, we will need a little bit of um, dependency on the Rust side. So C types contains all the types from C and C string allows you to uh, interface with C string. And that's where it became, I mean, that, that's a part that's a little bit uh, hairy still is that C string are implemented in one way with null terminated, they are null terminated string, but uh, Rust string are uh, size and string. So there we need something to uh, communicate between the two. And that will be useful to uh, get the logs. And we're running a little bit uh, short on time. So I will just, Copy paste uh, the, the 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 final demo and we will run it. So, but we will walk through uh, the code a little bit to see. So, uh, what I've done here is that I getting um, getting a log in the crazy fly requires us to call this log get var id because we need the ID of the log and then we need to call log get uint to get the uint value of the log. Uh, that could be called directly. We could call it over and over and over again here. You will find out that uh, those calls are around unsafe. Uh, they, are, uh, they are in unsafe blocks. It's because uh, the, the Rust compiler can be seen as a static uh, code analyzer. And if it cannot understand that your code is safe, it will not compile it. There is nothing to check in the C call. 
the compiler don't know what the SQL is doing. It could be doing anything. So uh, calling a C function is unsafe from the Rust point of view. So we have to add it in this unsafe block where the rules are a bit relaxed. Uh, but what I've done to make the code a little bit pretty here is that I've created a struct log that contains the ID. It's very similar to C struct, except that in Rust, you can implement uh, a little bit a la C++, implement functions attached to the struct. Uh, the new function is going to get the ID of the, of the variable and st store it in the struct, basically. Uh, and then we'll have a get uint uh, function that will take a reference to self, a ref uh, non mutable reference to this struct, and give us a value. Uh, and then once we have that set up, we can just create a log variable for up, right, front, back. So those are all our um, all our sensors, and we will get them into the group range. Na uh, name left, so range dot left, range dot right. This is string macro here will actually convert at compile time uh, the Rust string into a C string. So, um, and then that's our running loop, and we'll calculate in Rust. You can return values from if statements, which I have used here. So. If the right is close and the right is lower than the left, then we will set Vx to push velocity. Otherwise, we minus, if it's left that it's close by, minus push velocity, otherwise zero. So we calculate Vx, we calculate Vy, or the opposite. And then I have declared a function uh, set over point that takes vx vy the height to your right and we can just wait 20 milliseconds and start again uh, so and now we can see if that compiles it does not Um, so we will take the Baker project. I'm happy. I prepared. Ah, I'll, I'll take the Baker project. Yeah, thank you. Apparently, it's easy to see the error when you actually look at the stream. That's good. Uh, Anyway, this is the same thing. <laughs> so yes, we can see that when I make it, I have bind chain running. I have the Rust compilation happening here. Uh, and then we just link everything together. And now we have everything uh, compiled together. And I put my credit fly in the bootloader mode and I can flash it. So now it's flashed, it started. And uh, yeah, this new code has a small functionality that it actually react to the top sensor to take off. So now we take off and we can push the crazy fly around. And this is some Rust code now that is uh, flying the crazy fly autonomously. Um, so, uh, yes, I have one last slide very quickly, if I may. 
So what's next? Uh, I will I will finish the Quizfly lib. So at the very least, we'll be able to control the Quizfly from the ground with Rust. Uh, experiment with Rust in a firmware will most likely continue. It would be really nice to make it super easy, making a Quizfly API in Rust and make it super easy to make an app in the Quizfly in Rust. Uh, some future firmware might be written in Rust, at least that's something I'm interested about, but it will most likely be bootloaders or stuff that are isolated, very much like this printer thing. Something that not a lot of people uh, will look at, but that must work. Uh, and there is no current plan to rewrite any major firmware in Rust. I mean, we understand that uh, this is not a language that's very uh, widespread yet, uh, even though it deserves so. But we will wait a little bit to rewrite the Chris firmware in Rust. Yep, thank you. Thank you very much, Anno. Um, please, if there's any question, uh, ask them in the chat now. We have one here. Uh, Anno, are there any differences, uh, firmware size or speed, between the C version and the Rust version of the push demo? Uh, this is a very, very good question. I have not measured it. Uh, what I have seen with the bootloader, uh, because I have this experience, is that there is some Rust functionality that are still adding a lot of code by default. Uh, you can bypass that, you can walk around it, but by default, Rust will tend to use a little bit more space in the in the in the flash, and that's due to error management. They have a, a panic system where you can safely stop the program if anything goes wrong, and that by default will actually want to print strings. Uh, but that can be bypassed. Uh, so I guess since I use Unwrap that will panic, it's a bit bigger right now. Uh, okay. For the for the speed, I don't think, I, it's not measured, but I don't see how it will be slower. But Anoa can uh, do some disassembly and provide you with the object files later on. <laughs> and another question, is there any real-time operating system written in Rust today? Uh, Yes, uh, there, there is at least a binding to free iOS in the Crucify context. We've been playing with it. Um, uh, there is, um, I can't remember the name now, but there is at, at least Arctic is very interesting. It's implementing, uh, it used to be called RTFN, real time, real time for the masses. And it implements uh, RTOS only uh, based on the interrupt controller of uh, microcontrollers. And it calculates at compile time uh, access right, so that mutex has R NOP, basically. Uh, because at compile time, it will put the tasks in the right priority so that the mutex will work and you will have access to the data. But that's pretty experimental, but it works fairly well. Otherwise, there is at least one, the name eludes me, but uh, it's an RTOS written in Rust that is targeted to Rust or C, and that is uh, very safe, it isolates subtask. So it's designed to run tasks that are uh, non-trusted from each other. Yeah. But you can say that Rust has a vibrant embedded community, and there are plenty of R2Ss, I think, on the way. So I think we have to yeah. wait a few years to see what shakes out and what stays. But, and what we've seen as well is that uh, the, the, the things like embedded HAL are so powerful that the, 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 the point where you need an RTOS is uh, mm. pushed away. You mm. need, uh, you, for simple to medium programs, uh, the, the, the abstraction made by embedded HAL are so powerful that uh, you will be able to go pretty far without an RTOS, actually. That's true. Thank oh, you again, and yeah. thank you again, Anno. We can have more discussions in the Mibo room. And I would like you all to try try out the mountain uh, resort room. 